Hey, thank you all uh, for uh, coming here. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, Gordon, that was a PowerPoint. I've been saying bad things about PowerPoints, but that was more of a slideshow. <laughs> when I think of PowerPoint, I think we're some guy writes some crap. In. You know, there's about four lines, and they repeat the four lines. They speak the stuff that you can read. That's my idea of a PowerPoint presentation. That's why I'm not fond of it. But uh, what Gordon has given you, I should have gone first. <laughs> Gordon got down to the bottom, and I've got to start way up above that to, to make the politics make sense. And so I'm going to try to do that. And, uh, what is Gordon has described for where we live is going on everywhere in the world. There is a contest for resources everywhere on the earth. And uh, I don't know, you know what your news sources are. Uh, I'm fond of newspapers. I grew up with newspapers and I like to have a newspaper. So uh, the Atlanta paper cut me off. They cut off all of us in South Georgia. So I finally subscribed to the Wall Street Journal. Somehow they're able to deliver the Wall Street Journal to my house by U.S. mail every day, usually on the day it comes out. And so I can keep up with the uh, newspaper, reading the uh, largest circulation newspaper in the United States, the Wall Street Journal. And fully a third of their stories are about the issue of uh, fighting over resources around the world. It's just really amazing to, uh, to see that that is the, the old terms political economy kind of a combination of economics and politics. The political economy of the world is about division of uh, resources among the world's peoples. The world economy today is so different than that of it was, than, than what it was when we grew up. I, 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 Gordon has, was wrong about 1959. There were actually closer to four million people, four and a half million in Georgia in 59. I was born in 47. In 50, there were 3 million people in Georgia. And half of them were rural residents in 1950. And now we got close to 10 million, and uh, a fraction of them were rural residents. We got less than 50,000 farmers uh, in, the, in the state. So you can see how e even at that level, the, the change in the use of the land of Georgia has been so dramatic. It's, uh, and, and that change since World War II is actually trivial in terms of rural Georgia compared to what happened between 1920 and World War II. In that 15 year period, uh, or 20 year period, the number of farmers dropped so dramatically, it was just, it was startling. And you can still find the remnants of that old Georgia right down in the countryside. You find, well, the best places on the map. Look at all these named places on maps. And you go to those named places, and there's nothing there. Over and over again, there's a named place. There's nothing. There used to be a bunch of people living there. That's why it was a named place. The uh, cartographers didn't just wander around naming spots on the map. There were people there. And all those places vanished because the allocation of resources changed so dramatically. In that case, it was the collapse of cotton tenancy. People had grown cotton all over the South on either rented property or sharecropping or some other arrangement of land tenure that uh, was no longer sustainable in the, in the world markets. And those people were driven from the land and they went to the cities and uh, became industrial workers of one sort or another in a, a more urban environment. And so the stuff that Gordon's described uh, about what's happened over his lifetime, basically, in, in the South, with the resources in South Georgia, is an example of what's happening everywhere in the world. And it's getting faster and faster because there's that many more people and because the power of technology is so much greater than it used to be. 
And uh, we, we, technology, the kind of technology we're talking about, is usually developed in conjunction with warfare. And uh, that's where they develop the machinery and techniques that are then uh, uh, applied to what are called peacetime purposes. It's kind of an ironic term, peacetime. <laughs> but, uh, for example, over the last decade, up until about three years ago, the United States manufactured and used more dynamite than it ever used in all of the years up to that time. And the purpose of that was to blow mountains away in West Virginia to get at cheap coal for power plants. And of course, down in my effort, Nobel, that was a munitions so that was developed. Uh, you know, General Sherman, General Grant didn't mind killing people. He was an interesting personality. He would just keep throwing men in until he won. General Sherman was a, a very sensitive to the personnel thing, and, and he, would, he would have his men walk. Yeah, miles and miles and miles to avoid a fight. He would try to, and he did. He walked all the way to Atlanta. They didn't fight the way to Atlanta. The Atlanta campaign was a 100-day 100 100 walk. They walked from Chattanooga to Atlanta and fought very little. And they wound up winning Atlanta. And when he was attacked, he had his men dig ditches. They used shovels, not rifles. And uh, his men talked about it. They loved him. Uncle Billy will take care of us. He'll walk us to death to make us dig holes, but he won't get a shot. And uh, that trench warfare that, that Sherman really was the uh, first to make it a widespread activity. Of course, World War I, that was where that culminated, and they had these huge trenches, and so they had the technology had to overcome Sherman's holes. These men were hiding in, so they invented the tank, the tracked vehicle, like tracked armored vehicle, that could get past the trenches. It could carry the war out of the hole and, and back up onto a battlefield. After World War I, the tracked vehicle was uh, available for agriculture and for mining. And uh, we now have a uh, mountaintop river, or mountain river, strip mining on a scale that's unbelievable. Pits to mine even worthless stuff. I mean, there are holes in Georgia right now that are astonishing, where they just get rock, just gravel out of you know, these holes for the, the, because they can do it with this equipment. Technology has made the impact of a human so much greater than it ever has been by such a factor. And so you combine that with a larger number of people, and everything changes. And what we've got now is a worldwide economy that can, you can call it monopoly capitalism because they've set the price of everything. And there's no real competition, so it's kind of a monopoly. But the problem is they can make way more stuff than we can consume. And so they have to figure out ways to get us cons to consume the stuff that they can make that we really don't need, but the economy needs us to consume it. And the value of so many products, like the computer, the, the, the little phones, that you call the teenagers, those things, the actual input of Labor, human labor, even if you assumed you were paying American wages, you're not. But if you were paying, you know, $20 an hour for somebody to assemble a thing, and then the value of the mineral and, and, and well, it's all mineral components, plastics and metals. The value of those things is, is trivial compared to the sale price. And the sale price is actually the cost of selling it. What you're buying is advertising, marketing, promotion, media, TV, actors and actresses uh, carrying them around in front of others. That is a huge component of the cost of that commodity, of that product, is the cost of selling it, not the cost of producing it. And there's what they're doing is consuming resources as fast as they can because they have to, to make the economy keep humming. And when it stops humming, we saw what happened when it stopped humming in, in 07 and 08. It crashed like a, uh, like a brick dropped out of a tree. It just stopped because people quit borrowing money to build houses, to buy houses that were being built 
that nobody was ever going to live in. And that it was a that housing finance crisis is what prompted this recession. And we're still in. I mean, we're, it's slowly ending, but it's ending at a, at a very slow rate. And that crisis, one of the other costs that was introduced into this home production problem, first of all, they were absorbing costs with the cost of selling the product. And then they realized that they could make more money financing the product than they could either selling it or producing it. And so we put this new layer on top of what is sometimes called the underlying economy or the real economy. And that's this finance economy. And I, I know I'm pretty far afield from where Gordon was at this point, but, but I, I think I'm going to be able to bring it back to, uh, back to the river. Because this finance capital stuff that they have piled up on top of the real economy is an incredible drug on that economy. And just the example that I heard, I'm not very good at math, and so I, I tend to remember concepts and not numbers. But they had a show on uh, the radio, uh, This American Life. Y'all ever listen to that? It comes on Saturday at noon, you know. And then they Wednesday night. But the, they did a show about money during the uh, housing crisis. And they had three guys on that show that they interviewed for an hour. One of those guys, he says, I'm a Nina. That's no income, no assets. N-I-N-A. He says, I'm a Nina. I didn't have a job. And he said, no. I, I, I grew up in a rough neighborhood. A lot of the guys I grew up with are, you know, they're in, in organized crime. And uh, I borrowed money by walking into a bank to borrow money. I claimed I was going to buy a house. And they couldn't wait to give me a loan. They said, and they, they were, I talked to my friends that I grew up with. They couldn't borrow money like that. Even in high interest rates, they couldn't, they couldn't get those loans. But I could get that loan easy as pie. And then they talked to a guy in Nevada whose job was to make those loans to the Ninas. And his job was to make as many loans to those people, never mind whether they pay them, as fast as he could. And the more he made, the more money he made, because he was on a commission. And then they had a guy from New York City whose job was to take all those loans that the guys in Nevada had put together from the Ninas in Ohio and elsewhere, and turn those into derivatives, where they would take a little bit of this loan, a little bit of that loan, and put them together, and it would multiply. And there were the calculations were being done on these computers. It would be impossible to do it with editing machines and, and you know, beautiful paper and stuff. The stuff of my childhood is so far in the past of that reality now that you can't even think about it. But they are making these calculations so rapid. In any case, they calculated that if all of the loans made in the world housing market in 2008 had been able to pay off as if there was real demand and real money and real people, and if all that crap was real, there would have been generated in 2008 $36 trillion in return on investment. The profit on all of that stuff would have been three or four times the total underlying real economy of the world. Of course, of course if there was a bubble, it had to blow up. There was no way that that could ever be realized. Well, I mean, you know, you would have to have a, a, a ranch house for every house in the country. It would just it's impossible. And, but that pressure that's generated to invest money is what's driving this, this, this pressure on these resources. And we're not disinterested. I mean, it is, we should be, it would be nice to be disinterested, but we're not. We're deeply enmeshed in it. There's very little we do about it. Uh, cotton alone. <coughs> you saw Gordon had that graph that showed cotton with this little gray bulge at the bottom of all the different divisions of the crops. That it were. And cotton is occurring in the United States because the United States government is paying people to do it. And in fact, they're producing at a uh, cost lower than the world, the cost of the production of cotton. But because they're making money at it, they're not going to quit. But 
the water that's making that cotton grow is uh, in, in this area is being mined. We're producing something we don't need with stuff that we're going to need a whole lot after we're done. And so you can see that our the level of interest is, is strictly related to your uh, income. Where's your money coming from? And uh, how close are you to it? The thing that's happening now that we're starting to see all over the place, and now I am going to get to the river and creek in the way, is that the people who are participating in this system at its highest levels, that is the people who are making money off of it, are doing so with a growing awareness of what's going on. They realize that this is a gigantic zero-sum game. There is a limit. There are limits on all of these factors. There's a limit on income. There's a limit on labor productivity. There's a limit on automation uh, ability to replace human labor with capital. There are limits all over the place. And some people are going to win, and some people are going to lose. And we saw winners and losers in 08 and sequence after that, and we're starting to see them again. And in 08, it was not clear. Everybody was in on the carnival. It was like, you know, <laughs> the sky's the limit. Give me all like that, that double my order. I want to supersize that. Now there's a new understanding emerging in that class of people. And we're starting to see that happen even in the South. And so far in the South, it's happening in Mississippi, and it's a fascinating story, and it's, it's, it's worth exploring because it really does illustrate this point that I'm trying to make. <coughs> the Southern Company, we all know the Southern Company, Georgia Power Company, Alabama Power Company, Mississippi Power Company, Gulf Power Company, one of the largest electric utilities in the country. They decided to build a coal-fired power plant in the northern part of Mississippi to burn lignite. A lignite is the closest thing to dirt that will burn. It's, it's a very low grade coal, it has a very poor heat value, incredibly high ash content. It's not really a useful fuel. But they were going to put it through a plant to get gas and make it into a, a, a flammable gas. And they were going to burn gas in their power plant so it would be a gas fired power plant where the gas came from a chemical plant next door. And uh, the lobbyist for the Southern Company, their chief lobbyist in the country, was a guy named Haley Barber, who was a two-term governor of Mississippi. And uh, before that, he was chairman of the Republican National Committee. He's a smart guy, and he knows what he's doing, but he's, he's, he's a classic, ultimate insider. And so he got the federal government to agree to help finance this, this power plant. And then they went to the Mississippi Public Service Commission and they got two, they have three commissioners there, and they're divided geographically. And the people in the south part of Mississippi, the Gulf Coast part, that's the southern company part of Mississippi, that's where you can buy your power from Mississippi Power. The power plant was up in the TVA part of Mississippi. Those people don't buy the southern company power. There was a land rush to grab the lignite problem. Otherwise worthless land, you know, timberland, in North Mississippi. The people that lived there were very nervous about this lignite grab. And their public service commissioner voted against building the power plant because his constituents were saying, we don't want to do this. We, we, we don't like any of this. And uh, they didn't have to pay for it, but they didn't want to do it because of the land aspect of it. So the people in South Mississippi, their public service commissioner, Mr. Bentz, Leonard Bentz. Leonard had been a deputy sheriff. His daddy was the sheriff. He was a deputy sheriff. And then his daddy got a good job running the local or regional development authority. And Leonard went into the legislature, and then from the legislature he went to the Public Service Commission. And he supported the power plant. And then the third member was a mid-state guy, uh, kind of middle district of Mississippi. And uh, uh, Mississippi Power Company just bought him. So he was he was available whatever. So they, they agreed to make the ratepayers pay for this uh, power plant on a two-to-one vote. And they started building the power plant, and they quickly ran into a number of problems. One, they couldn't get enough skilled help to build the power plant. 
and uh, they had to keep recruiting from farther away. The cost that cost kept rising. There was a big uh, escalation in the cost of various materials, steel, concrete, and solar used in the power plant. And they estimated wrong. The engineers hadn't figured it out right, so the estimated cost kept rising, and they kept loading the rates up. Say, well, we're going to have another rate increase, another rate increase. They had to keep going to the Public Service Commission, and. Uh, the Sierra Club in Mississippi, which it, it actually exists, and uh, uh, the director of the buddy of mine, and uh, he, he kept me posted on all of this stuff, and uh, they were they were making enough noise that were pointing out, look, 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 they, they don't even know if they can build this power plant. They have put half that man hours into it already, and they're already at twice the estimated cost, and they still don't know that the additional half the man hours we've got to get to get it completed is actually going to finish it. And the chemical plant that's going to make the gas to run it is still not clear it's going to work on the scale that it's got to work to make the plant work. Why don't we just burn natural gas in it and forget all this half, more than half the cost? And there's, there's a lot of controversy. And suddenly a new group emerged in Mississippi. Here's my point. I'm sorry I drag on with this thing. There's a group in Mississippi called the Bigger Pie Forum. You can look it up on the internet. I recommend it. Bigger Pie Forum, and it's a, a group of very wealthy Mississippians, including a guy who's got an agricultural chemical company and a fertilizer business. He, was, he is the first Mississippian to ever get a billion dollar corporation in Mississippi. And he's on the Bigger Pie Forum, and then there's a newspaper publisher out of Greenville, yeah, Greenville called uh, Emmerich. Mr. Emery, I, I can't remember uh, his first name, but his daddy used to run that paper, and his uncle, just this is a coincidence, used to be the county commission chairman in DeKalb County, Georgia, back in the 1960s. He was a 